Whatever the tribe around this world, it's a relationship with the place, and they see the tree and the animal and the river and the mountain as a relative. And it's not transactional, it's relationship. When we think about nature and protecting it, it always feels like it's altruistic and it's this act of sacrifice. But what indigenous communities, the people that I've become friends with on my shoots, what they've taught me is that it is probably the most self-serving thing we can do as humanity. You know, we've had the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution, and people are now talk talking about an energy revolution in the form of solar that's going to be abundant. And there's a, over 100 times more solar electricity available, potentially, than the energy that the human race uses at the moment. We focused at many levels on nature through the, you know, uh, it's been a kind of underlayer, but there hasn't yet been a focus on the most powerful force of all of this, and that is nature itself. So climate change has been moving at a pace which outstrips everything. It's the biggest crisis coming towards us, and a little bit like the beetle that uh, Anand was speaking about, we are mesmerized with everything else except the one true thing, the one force and power that we actually cannot control. But even there, there are different aspects to it and facets to it. There is the human, the technological, and the pure, raw nature force uh, to unpack those things, and they can be absolutely no one session that really looks at climate change in a substantive way or our relationship with nature in a substantive enough way. So necessarily, this will just be three facets of a conversation, but we have fantastic speakers to at least open those doors into the conversation. We have Martin Green, who's the father of solar technology. He pretty much, of course, not single-handedly, but with his team, took the efficiency of a solar cell from about 9 or 8%, which is when he came onto the scene, to the 29% that it is now. 94 or 96% of global solar production depends on the perk cell that he and his team have created more efficiencies for. So he's won every prize in the world except perhaps the Nobel yet. He's a professor at the University of New South Wales. So that's Martin Green. We also have Peter Seligman, who's the CEO of Neotara, but he was also the founder and CEO of Conservation International, a very, very veteran conservationist, who again is focusing on building bridges. A, again, a big part of our intent, at least to bring all of us together, is to try and start synthesizing all these different facets of our collective life. And he's very much somebody who's trying to build a bridge between two of the possibly most polarized uh, sections of the climate change debate, which is corporates and then civil society and indigenous communities. And he's trying to find the common language that will bring it all together to serve one purpose, which is to mitigate climate change, which is the train hurtling at us. And then we have Malaika Waz, who's a filmmaker, she's a National Geographic explorer, she's an adventurer, but most importantly, she's that young voice. You know, we keep talking about leaving what we leave for the young generation, but we sometimes need to see that in real life, the passion that drives it, the awareness, consciousness, and hope, but also that knowledge that what we are doing, one generation be before them, is not good for the planet, not good for all of us. Very powerful storytellers, all three of them, and to knit it together, is again the most powerful storyteller of all is Thomas Friedman, who's been watching this dynamic between nature, humans, technology for 40 years. And I'm going to hand the stage over to them. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome all four of them on stage.
market collapse creating one financial crisis after another, and it often seems that the news can only get worse. It is unequivocal that human activities are responsible for climate change. That's the finding of a new study by the UN's Intergovernmental Panel. Well, welcome. Um, this is a panel on climate change, biodiversity, um, uh, and the role of indigenous communities in enabling the advancement of all three. Um, we've got a terrific panel here. Um, uh, Martin Green, who is really the premier pioneer of solar energy cells with his team in Australia. Um, Malika Vaz, who's a award-winning uh, Nat Geo and other documentary filmmaker uh, uh, telling the story of both biodiversity and indigenous people, and Peter Seligman, who is the founder of Conservation International, and um, since then the founder of Neotero. Um, and we're going to look at this problem from all these different angles of both the solution, uh, the uh, plant and animal biodiversity challenges, and the challenges to human communities. And so, Peter, I want to start with you. Um, you founded Conservation International, uh, which is a great biodiversity-preserving organization. But you went off uh, three or four years ago and founded a new organization called Neoterra. Tell us why you founded that group and um, what is the core of your mission right now? Great. Thank you so much, Tom. And it's a real honor to be here. Um, you know, I started Conservation International a long, long time ago, over, well, let's see, in 1987. And, uh, and the idea then was I was obsessed with how do you protect territory around the world that was important for biological diversity, and, uh, and eventually realized that uh, the communities really had to be the beneficiaries of conservation if conservation was going to really take hold. Uh, and, and so for years focused on, on that intersection between communities and the protection of nature with wonderful success, but at a scale that despite the you know, billion and a half hectares of territory that were protected was just a fragment of what really was required. And, and so uh, in 2017, when I decided to step down as the CEO, uh, I asked a group of scientists that were working with me at, uh, at Conservation International, I asked them, where on the planet Earth do we have that intersection of really important biodiversity and essential territories for absorbing and containing carbon, uh, as sequestering carbon on the planet Earth? And they drew maps, and I asked them afterwards when I looked at these maps that really circumnavigated the entire planet, I said, well, who owns these territories? And they came back and they said to me that a third of the earth was under the guardianship of indigenous peoples. About a third of the above ground carbon was on their territory. About 40% of the biological diversity. And most of the places where there is this intersection between climate and biodiversity were under territories, controlled by territories of indigenous peoples. And then I asked the question, who is supporting them? And the answer was, very, very few peoples, 
no major organizations, and the organizations that were supporting them were not guarded, were not guided and controlled by indigenous peoples. And so we decided to create a new organization, Neotero, and it means Our Earth. Um, and we decided to build an organization where at least half, and actually it's, we have 12 board members, uh, seven are indigenous, the chair is indigenous, he's Maori, he's one of the five Supreme Court justices in New Zealand. The vice chair is the Mosquito woman from Nicaragua, a really strong, powerful person. Uh, there are Warwani, which are Amazonian leaders. It is, it is a, there are Cherokee leaders. And this group of people actually brings to the challenge of conservation a very, very different perspective. And the perspective they bring that is so important to underscore and to highlight is that indigenous peoples are taking care of territory not because they are commodifying it and they see an economic value, but because of a relationship that they see whether, whatever the tribe around this world, it's a relationship with the place and they see the tree and the animal and the river and the mountain as a relative. And it's not transactional, it's relationship. And so we decided it was time to actually uh, see whether we could get the traditional approach of conservation, which was fortresses, out, sideline that, and instead elevate a different relationship, one that goes beyond commodity, uh, one that, that, that is built upon a value system. And that was why we created it. And, and Tom, in the, in the seven years since we launched it, we now have partnerships with about 300 different indigenous tribes from around the world, across the Pacific, the Inuit, the Northern Territories, Africa, uh, all across the Northern Amazon, whose territories uh, exceed, just in this short time, about 400 million acres. And most significantly, there is a hope and an expectation and a desire amongst many, many indigenous peoples around the world, how can they participate? Because they see it as an opportunity to, to give back, an opportunity for self-governance, an opportunity to actually transform the way that the rest of us look at this place. And that's why we did it, and that's where we are today. We're gonna to dive deeper, just one quick follow-up, and then I wanna... Um... Uh, Malika and, and uh, Martin in. Peter, what does Neotero do uh, for these communities? H how are you empowering and enabling them? And give us an example, or a couple of examples, of exactly how your organization works. Well, the first thing is that we do not go into any place and offer a solution. It, our efforts are built upon building trust. And as you can imagine, for the last five centuries of colonization of territory, there's a great trust divide. So we see ourselves as neither indigenous nor non-indigenous, but that tense space between different cultures. And so we go in and we listen. So our team, which is just like our board, is predominantly indigenous, but it's, it's a blend of cultures. Um, we go in and try to hear and listen and build a trusting relationship, which involves going to the home of our partners and they're coming to our home and beginning to see that there has to be a relationship. So that's the beginning. And then as part of listening is trying to understand what is their own perspective as to the challenges they face. And these challenges are enormous because if you have a spectacular territory in the Amazon or in the Himalayas or in sub-Saharan Africa or across the Pacific, there are a lot of entities that look at your territory as a pantry. It's still healthy, it's got trees and minerals and water and fish, we want it. And so number one, it's what has to be done to give the support that's required so these communities can defend themselves. And that involves just to de you know, defense in terms of monitoring who comes in, being to have quick access through technology of eyes from the sky to see where the invasion is taking place having the ability to respond, also having the legal authority to take action, which means that it's both place-based in that territory, but it also involves policy. How do you change the policies of a nation state so they recognize that it is in their enlightened self-interest to support 
what an indigenous community can do to protect territory. And so we will do whatever is needed. Now, one of the key missing ingredients in many of these places is educational systems. And most of the education that's implanted on top of them is basically, we're going to eliminate your culture. You're going to learn our stuff. You're not going to remember where you come from. And so we look at how do we help retain language and culture as well. And we are doing this uh, with, I mean, one of the most fascinating places on the planet Earth is in a valley called the Javari Valley, which is northwestern Brazil, bordered by Peru on the west, on the, uh, Peru on the west, Colombia on the north. It's a territory that's the size of Portugal. It's big, no roads. 15 tribes that have never had external contact. Yet, gold companies, timber companies, fishing companies moving in and assassinating, killing leaders, shooting children. And so we were called to engage, went and visited there, and now are building support for their own organizations that have the capability of keeping intruders out and actually doing what they feel is necessary so that they can guarantee the future of their language, their culture, and their place. Who funds you, by the way? We are funded by um, a small number of individuals and foundations that think that this is, the, this is the cutting edge of actually securing the health of the planet. There is a global initiative now called 30 by 30, which is basically by 2030, let's ensure that 30% of the oceans and the terrestrial and the biodiversity of the Earth remain healthy. What we have been able to convince those funders of is that this will not happen without the engagement and the support and the self-governance by indigenous peoples of their absolutely essential territories. And so a group of funders have come in and said, we believe that, we will give you the resources at a scale that allows you to do that. And so the organization has emerged as, as having those resources. And, and we look at this as a long-term commitment. It cannot be in and out. It's gotta be a deep commitment to the diversity of cultures, to what they can teach us, to our being able to listen to them. And that way we have a chance of getting out of the mess that industrial society has actually created. Thank you. Um, Malika, um, in your work as a storyteller, um, about this, uh, the drama that's unfolding now around climate change and biodiversity loss. What has you most worried and what has you most excited from your work now in the field? Thanks, Tom, and thanks, Shoma, for that introduction. It's an honor to be here. Honestly, I would say that the thing that has me most worried is that when it comes to our value system right now, we're still building upon a value system that helped create and fund the fossil fuel industry that helped it to scale to become the behemoth that it is today. And it's so critical for us at this point in history to figure out where we want to go from here and what are the values that can influence us to be heading in that direction and really supporting the green transition. Um, I'm glad you touched upon the idea of scale when it comes to protecting communities and nature because I think if we want to protect nature at scale, there's no way to do it without people. With my work at our production company, Untamed Planet, a lot of our work for networks like Nat Geo and the BBC focuses on telling stories about how communities are the biggest advocates and protectors of the natural world. And by listening to them, what I've realized actually is that there isn't a monolith when it comes to indigenous communities. Not every single indigenous community member believes that nature is intrinsically valuable and they must protect it against all odds. Many people, like most of us, are driven by economic circumstance and the need to provide for families. So what we've learned is that when you unbundle that idea of the noble savage and when you begin to see people for who they truly are, you realize that for the communities that protect nature, there is this intrinsic love for wildlife and nature, but they also understand that there is so much to gain from protecting the natural world. There is a huge impetus for action because a healthy planet keeps us all safe. Give me some examples that, 
that you've yeah. uh, adduced in your films? So one of the most interesting examples that we encountered on a shoot in India, in, on the east coast of India, in a place called Andhra Pradesh, is this amazing mangrove reforestation project where they took these abandoned shrimp farms and basically reforested approximately 10,000 hectares of land. And initially it was, you know, a World Bank funded and foreign conservation funded project, but they had a lot of local community buy-in. And the community that then began to drive the efforts, and what they found was that by protecting mangroves, they were able to create healthy spawning grounds and breeding grounds for fish. And their economy was way more healthy because their fisheries were surviving. And the reason that's so critical is because when we think about nature and protecting it, it always feels like it's altruistic and it's this act of sacrifice. But what indigenous communities, the people that I've become friends with on my shoots, what they've taught me is that it is probably the most self-serving thing we can do as humanity, to protect nature because it brings us so much value. It is the, the most critical challenge of our time. Where would you... Um, I'm asking this question out of total ignorance. Um, yeah. Where would you, how would you describe the environmental movement in India today? What state is it at? Um, I don't hear a lot about it, you know, in terms of uh, the global environmental movement. There's been a lot of uh, resistance in India during some of the climate negotiations. Yeah. So how would you describe the state of sort of Indian environmentalism, the, cu the cutting edge um, uh, of that movement here? Well, I'd say, Tom, honestly, like a lot of countries across the world, it's important to decouple um, the idea of protecting nature and the idea of combating climate change. So I'm going to answer your question on both fronts. I think when it comes to protecting nature, I think India has done a remarkable job in many ways. We still have charismatic megafauna. I live in New York now, and whenever I'm home on shoot in India, I'm constantly in awe of how we've been able to protect elephants and tigers in a way that the United States hasn't been able to mm -hmm. in many ways. So I think on the front of nature and wildlife, we've done a great job. There's still a lot of work to do, and I think one of the biggest challenges is we have these massive aspirations and we have a lot of people and a lot, not enough land very often. So I think that development um, conservation struggle is still being figured out and there's a lot more work. But I think India also has a lot to celebrate, for sure. And then on the climate front, I personally think that we need to step up our game. India is probably one of the most important players when it comes to mitigating climate change and adapting to climate change today. So we need to be making sure that when it comes to these international conventions, I was at COP recently, and I think India could have done a lot more to financially commit, uh, intellectually commit to the battle. Um, but equally, besides international conventions, I think domestically, working with national and state entities to make sure that we have enforcement of international conventions and national ideas is critical because very often we come back from these incredible summits with energy and with a sense of hope. But when it comes to actually brass tracks and getting stuff done, it's critical to make sure that we have that cross-sectoral approach and we have departments talking to each other. We need to have, you know, our finance guys talking to our wildlife guys because without that, it's not going to go anywhere. Great. Martin, you are one of the least known, most important people uh, in the world of climate change. I, I, um, uh, and so it's a pleasure to be here with you and introduce you and your work to this audience. Um, your team at the University of New South Wales in Australia um, held a record for 30 years? 30 years, yes. 30, how many people have held the record for anything for 30 years, okay? <laughs> um, and uh, would you? Would you share with us here, what was that record? Um, how was it broken? And why was that good news? Okay, well, you know, most of our electricity historically has been generated from fossil fuels. And in fact, um, it's still one of the biggest contributors to the carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere is burning of fossil fuels to generate electricity. And uh, I guess starting from the early 70s, there was an interest in finding alternatives to that. And solar was initially developed for use on spacecraft. So the, 
you know, the fourth satellite to go up in the 1950s had some solar cells on it and they worked really well and the industry was developed supplying cells for these spacecraft. But with the um, interest in um, getting away from fossil fuels as a source of energy, there was programs launched internationally to try and develop solar technology so that it'd be cheap enough to use terrestrially. And, and that's where we came in. We are working on improving the performance of the cells. So from 1983 up to 2014, that's the 30 years, we held the record for the performance of the silicon cells, improved the performance of the cells by over 50% in relative terms. And the technologies we developed along the way are now the technologies that are used in production. So 90% of the cells use technology that was originally developed in our very small lab, originally at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. What's your background and how did you get into this? Well, and I was trained in electrical engineering, so I originally became interested in microelectronics in the late 60s. That was a very exciting field and uh, there was a lot of developments. People were starting to put multiple transistors onto a chip and so on. So it was very exciting area for a young person like myself to get involved with. So that was my initial interest. And then as I grew older, I, I um, missed a lot of the impact that microelectronics has subsequently had, like the internet, AI, all these things that we've talked about during the earlier sessions in this conference. I missed all that and I thought, oh, well, you know, you're going to use microelectronics to make better TV sets and things. And, um, you know, is that really a, something that I want to be working on for the rest of my career? So then it was coincided with this um, growth in interest in developing new sources of energy terrestrially, terrestrially. And I knew that my expertise in microelectronics could be applied to this field. So I switched to, quite deliberately to trying to develop solar cells and didn't quite realize the impact that our work would have, but very pleased that it has made a massive impact um, not only through the technology that we developed through the, for the cells, but during the 80s, we had many, over 80s and 90s, we had many visitors from overseas um, studying in our laboratories because we were held the record for efficiency, so everyone sort of visited to learn what they could. But um, many of my PhD students um, have had, um, are from overseas, many from China, and uh, at the turn of the century, some of the more adventurous decided that they wanted to set up manufacturing in China, which prior to that had no commercial manufacturing and was devoid of all the infrastructure. But that initiative is really what has turned the whole technology on its head. And- Because um, it's driven it down the cost volume curve. It's driven down the cost really dramatically. You know, so much so that the International Energy Agency has now declared that solar provides now the cheapest source of electricity in history and uh, it's the, the cheapest source in, in most countries of the world. And uh, the good news is it's only going to get cheaper. So some people are now talking about a third major historical revolution. You know, we've had the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution, and people are now talk, talking about an energy revolution in the form of solar that's going to be abundant. And there's a, over 100 times more solar electricity available potentially than the energy that the human race uses at the moment. And uh, it's got this potential to be incredibly cheap, already the cheapest source of electricity in history, according to the International Energy Agency, but the cost is still going down quite quickly. So you are the human embodiment of a rule I have, which is that when it comes to um, uh, clean energy, if it isn't boring, it isn't green. Okay, and um, what I always say about that is that everyone wants to be Al Gore and win an Oscar and a Nobel and have you know people stop you on the street and uh, I'd like to be Al Gore, but a lot of the actually critically important work happens in really boring ways done by people who really know stuff. Um, and it's, it's something I've always admired. You know, people, I, I, in my book Hot, Flat and Crowded, I profile a guy um, uh, who actually figured out a way to have the amount of energy use in every Coke machine, the dispensing machine. And 
To do that, though, you first of all have to understand how a Coke machine works, the engineering of that, and how it interfaces with a public utility. And there is nothing more boring on God's green earth than a public electricity utility. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I admire people who get into that, you know, uh, get into the, the really boring engineering stuff. So how did you make this breakthrough, this lab in New South Wales, uh, up against the world? Talk a little bit about what was the breakthrough and who broke the record? Was it you who broke your old record or somebody else? Yeah, well, well, firstly, I wouldn't uh, describe my career in solar as a big boring. It's really been, it's really been very exciting. Um, I meant the, 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 the hard part of it. But the, um, yeah, I, I guess um, we, we got our first record in 83, and it was through um, understanding the, the physics of what was going on in the cell. So the, the photovoltaic effect really stems from the work of Albert Einstein in understanding the nature of light and the way it interacted with matter you know, back in 1905. But the solar cells were developed. You know, first solar cells made from silicon were made in the 1940s and then in the 1950s with the development of semiconductor industry and everything, the technology really started taking off then. And then driven by their use in space and then this terrestrial use sort of motivated us to work harder on the problem. So, you know, once you set a world record, um, you're very motivated to keep ahead of the competition. So... Um, and the that, record is, how is the record manifested? It's yeah, well, well fortunately, um, it's quite, uh, quite a standard way of measuring the performance of a solar cell. And um, the U.S. had large programs uh, during the oil crisis and so on to find alternative sources of energy. And in that program, they had many subcontractors, but they established the protocol of having any claimed improvement verified at one of their national labs. Mm. So the whole industry has maintained that. So when you claim a record, it's a record that's been independently verified by someone that really knows what they're doing. So there's no um, disputes about who holds a record because um, it's all been certified and documented and so on. So that was very fortunate for us. And the record is power generated per square inch of a uh, Yeah, no, exactly, the, the power per unit area. Yeah. And, and that's really important to the economics because um, you know, the uh, economics depend very much on the area of the cell that you, that you need. So the cells are encapsulated with a glass cover sheet, so the area of the glass depends on it. They've got an aluminium frame around them, the amount of aluminium depends upon it. When you ship them to the field, the transport costs and everything depend on the number of modules you have to ship, so the, again the area. And then when you install them, all the support structures and even the wiring and number of trenches you have to dig and so on depends on the area. So th this efficiency has proved to be a really important parameter and all the manufacturers are pushing, you know, as we speak to squeeze this extra bit of performance out of their commercial product because it has enormous economic payback to them. For all the excitement though of solar, it still provides what percent of global electricity today? Yeah, well, well the figure for last year was 6%, but there's over 20 countries now where the figure is over 20%. Interesting. So Australia joined the 20% club last year where 20% of our grid supplied electricity was uh, supplied by solar. So, um, Who would be the top three? Yeah, well, um, you know, like Germany has been a pioneer in the solar field. They have a, a large percentage of their electricity. I don't think they're up to 20% yet. Um, many, many small countries, um, you know, in, in the Pacific and so on, have large amounts of solar providing, well, solar providing large amounts of their energy requirements. Um, Italy is another big user, Spain, you know, the Mediterranean countries in Europe, they're all up around the 20% level. Um, but in Australia, it's mainly um, privately owned systems on the rooftops of private homes that supply of that 20%, 14% was supplied by rooftop solar. And um, along with wind, which complements the solar really well because it blows mainly at night and in winter, so it complements the output of solar quite well in many countries, including Australia. 
we had another 12% of our national electricity supplied by wind and another 6% from hydro. So we're, we're getting up close to um, renewables being the major source of electricity supply in Australia. But only you know, a little over a decade ago, Australia depended 90% on coal for its electricity generation. So um, even though coal provides 40% of our electricity at the moment, it's a lot different from what it was um, only a decade or so ago. And I think that we're going to see that very rapid change in many countries because it's driven now by the economics rather than environmental credentials of the solar. It's the economic advantage that is causing this transition in Australia. And I think that's going to follow many other countries and uh, India has been one of the big players in solar so um, over the recent years solar has been the largest source of new electricity generation that's been installed here in India you know as, as is happening in an increasing number of countries and just we're going to come back to you but did your lab break your own record or did somebody else do it Oh, we kept breaking our own records for um, 30, of the, 30 of the last 40 years, uh, but in 2014, a Japanese group broke our record, uh -huh. and then since then, a Chinese group has, uh, has, holds the present record. So the silicon cells convert um, up to about 27% of the sunlight falling on them into electricity. So people wonder, you know, why that's so low. Um, and, and it's because the... Um, the solar cells just convert the photons in sunlight. So you've got the red photons that don't have much energy and you've got the blue photons that have enough energy to give you sunburn and skin cancer and so on. Um, but this, to a solar cell, they all look the same. One photon, you get one electron generated by the cell. Um, so you're limited to efficiency of about 29% with a silicon cell, but if you stack cells of different material, on top of the cell, um, a, a material that, say, can convert blue photons efficiently, but not the red ones, you can increase the overall efficiency. So even though you're limited to 29% with the silicon cell, you can get, in principle, you know, well over 40% by stacking cells. And that's the problem that we're working on in our lab at the moment. Terrific. Uh, Peter, um, you know, one of the things I've always felt is when I was growing up in Minnesota, um, the word later had a very different meaning. What? When I was growing up in Minnesota and thinking about biodiversity, um, I could do something now to help work on the environment, or I could do it later. Um, but I think what is really defining about this moment is later is officially over. Later will now be too late. And one of the things that I've always admired about your work at CI and Miotero is that you've understood that the problem of both biodiversity and clean energy is a scale problem. If you don't have scale, you have a hobby. I like <laughs> hobbies. I used to build model airplanes. I wouldn't try to save the climate as a hobby. And one of the ways that you have gotten scale is by partnering with business, that there's only one thing as big as Mother Nature, and that is Father Profit. Um, and by leveraging Father Profit to your mission, have really delivered scale. So I want you to talk about one example that, um, uh, you know, I think had a huge impact on Conservation International and, and now, and that's a company called Walmart. Um, tell me the story of your interaction with Walmart, because we have a lot of business people here. I think you'd be very interested. Great. Um, you know, we think about innovation, and then we think about demonstration. But if we're going to deal with the massive challenges that we've created in terms of biodiversity and climate, we need to think about acceleration and scale. And, and, and non-governmental organizations don't have that on their own. Um, and so I spent a lot of time making lists of which are the entities that have, that can be global agents of change, where they actually have the standing and the reach and the penetration that if they were to embrace these ideas and this awareness, it would have a massive impact. Mm -hmm. uh, one day I received a phone call, this was in around 2005, from a man by the name of Rob Walton. 
Uh, and Rob was the chairman of the board of Walmart, the son of the founder, Sam uh, Walton. And, and someone from the World Bank, a friend of mine who was the president of the World Bank, a fellow named Jim Wolfenson, had said, if you want to get involved in the environment, you should talk to Peter. So, so, so Rob called and he basically said, an issue that is of concern to all of our family members who love the outer doors is environment. We all, and that's the glue that will keep our family together because we're a little distorted. We have this massive wealth, but I want to retain a core value, a relationship with my children, my nieces, my nephews, et cetera, et cetera. And so I said, come over to visit my office, and he did, and he shows up with a notepad and spends three days listening to our planning discussions, and then said, can we go visit some of these places all over the world where, where, where Conservation International is looking at biodiversity hotspots and ocean spots and the places around the world that were just so significantly important? And so we started going to places, and we went to Suriname, we went to South America, we went to Africa, we went all over the world together. Uh, and one day we took a trip to go diving off the coast of Costa Rica on a beautiful place called Cocos Island. Mm -hmm. And you go out by boat. It's a three-day chug out to Cocos Island. And on the way home from this beautiful dive, and it was with Rob and his son, Ben, who was 18-year-old at the time, um, we were surrounded by this exquisitely beautiful school of spinner dolphins. And then we saw a boat cut through it was a Taiwanese fishing vessel that was filled to the top with shark fins. And, and I said to Rob, Rob, if you want to change the world, it's going to take more than your family. You have to transform Walmart. And his response, which is natural, was, well, we're just one shareholder. His son, Ben, said, that's bullshit, Dad. We're the largest shareholder. We can have a voice. And so we got back to, to, uh, to the United States, and Rob immediately set up a meeting with the CEO of Walmart, a man by the name of Lee Scott. And we went in to see Lee, and uh, I brought a pound of salmon with me. And I said to him, Lee Scott, Walmart sells more salmon than any company on the planet Earth. The dye of this salmon, the pink of this salmon is an artificial dye. And the coast of Chile is an ecological wasteland because it's farmed salmon. And this is where it gets really important. And this is where I think all of us need to kind of tune in. Lee Scott's response was, I had my first granddaughter last week. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we called a meeting of all of his buyers. And his buyers were young people. It was the next generation. And he said, look, I want to focus on on doing something in the environment. I don't want to do it all across the company. I want to pick a couple of parts of our business to think about it. And a young man stood up and he said, Lee, are you telling us that we can come out of the closet about being environmentalists? And he said, yes. Which one of you wants to start? And they all stood up. And what happened was an infectious moment in Walmart. It was an effort that was greeted with extraordinary enthusiasm by the young people that were employees. And it was basically an effort to think, what could they do to change the way they purchased? And my hope was every single supplier to Walmart would have to go through a new filter. And it was a filter of sustainability. And the young people at Walmart wanted the same thing. The end result was they saved hundreds of millions of dollars every year by saying to all their suppliers, we will not accept your goods unless they're in recycled material. That meant they saved 300 million bucks a year in taking stuff to the garbage dump. They said to their suppliers of fish, you need to harvest fish in a sustainable way, both in the way you catch the fish, but we need to make certain that the communities that are catching the fish get a fair payback. And it basically became you know, an effort that infected the entire organization, but more than infecting the organization, it infected all of their suppliers, from the soft drinks to the computers, everybody got involved in it. And it spread so that now Walmart, which is not a perfect company, now Walmart is actually, the CEO is the young man that raised his hand, 
Doug McMillan. And all the suppliers have come together in a competition to see who can reduce their solar footprint, their carbon footprint, the greatest. It's called Project Gigaton. And I think that that's what we need to be thinking about, and that's something that everybody here needs to understand. There is absolutely no rule written in stone about how corporations engage that says, we do not care about the environment. It's something that our consumers are interested in, it's something our employees are interested in, and it's something that secures, as you said, it secures a supply chain forever. And, and, that's, that's, and we've seen that happen, it's across the board with companies competing to see who can do a better job now. Not all of them are there. And I think that there is, you know, there is both a internal drive that's required and there has to be a regulatory incentive as well. We need to marry policy with this. And so, you know, that's where we are, that's what we have to be working on. And I'll just wrap it up by saying that there's too much at stake not to do this. You know, there is too much at stake in terms of radical shifts in climate, radical shifts in drought, radical shifts in floods, heat waves, damage, immigration, impact on societies. We, we need to embrace this. Later is officially too late. You bet. Um, uh, Peter, if people here in the audience want to be involved with Neoterra, will you be around? If, if, uh, For companies? sure. Yeah, terrific. For sure. Um, I, I wanted to touch on one other thing, because you asked a question earlier yeah. about scale, yeah. about scale and India. Yeah. And I just want to touch upon, there is a wonderful partnership that has emerged here. Mm -hmm. And it's not just India, it's India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh. It's called the Great Partnership for the Himalayan Forests. Mm -hmm about 300 NGOs. It's being led by the Balipara Foundation, working with Conservation International, Bhutan Trust, there's the Ashoka Trust, and, and it's really looking at, I mean, we all talk about the Amazon. We all talk about the Amazon, but the Himalayan, there are two, there, there's basically about a billion people that are within that watershed. It's the Brahmaputra and the Ganges. And in the last, since 2000, 10% of the forest cover has been cleared. The mangroves have been destroyed. So there's a huge effort now that really needs to be supported locally, not just globally, to really look at a reforestation, livelihoods connected to environment, and it's right here, and it's as important an initiative as any initiative on the planet right. Earth. Thank you, thank okay. you. Um, Malika, you, you just finished a film, Sacrifice Zone. Tell us about it. How does it illustrate these problems? And then, Martin, I'm going to tee you up at the end. Um, how do we get that number for solar from 6% to over 20 globally? Something like So we just finished working on a documentary in partnership with National Geographic Society. And the focus of the film was looking at the world's biggest industries, so fossil fuels, plastic and fast fashion and its impact, disproportionate fast impact. Fast fashion. Yeah, mm -hmm. disproportionate impact on communities of color. And for me personally as well, I think it was definitely a big shift because when I started my career, the stories that I, you know, gravitated towards were stories about wildlife trafficking. It was the stories of the small guys. It was, you know, wildlife traffickers in China and poachers in India and people who were truly not at the very top of the supply chain at all but we're making a little bit of money from the destruction of the natural world. And then I spent some time on a fishing vessel in the Indian Ocean. We were out at sea for about a week. And at the end of the week, I realized that these fishermen had put so much effort and they came back with so little produce, right? It's an incredibly hard job. No one chooses to be a wildlife trafficker. And I think that moment really was, for me, a turning point to start looking at the bigger forces shaping our planet. And this film, Sacrifice Zone, um, was a deep dive into seeing how big industry really has to be accountable. Mm -hmm. Even the idea of the carbon footprint, it was invented by one of the biggest oil and gas producers, BP. And it's made us all feel guilty for the longest time checking, you know, what our carbon 
carbon footprints are personally, checking about you know, whether or not that plastic toothbrush we use has an impact on the planet. But it's critical at this point to really make sure that the onus of accountability is on corporations, and equally for people in the environmental movement to not antagonize that sector, to know that we cannot have perfect allies. We can have a couple of perfect allies, but we can have many, many, many more imperfect allies who are trying their 100% to change the way we protect our planet. And there will be you know, aspects of their businesses that will take longer to make sustainable because it's a, it's a long game, but there are aspects that we can truly double down on right now and expand in terms of urgency. And when it comes to scale, again, it's really critical to make sure that we're talking to corporates just as much as we're talking to people at the grassroots level. Because when we start looking at the issue of climate change and mitigating all of the emissions that we have out there, but we don't think about the biodiversity side of the problem, what often happens is that we're creating ecosystems that on paper mean so much, you know, 10,000 hectares of forested land. But if that is, you know, not a primary growth forest, if that cannot sustain wildlife, it can, if it cannot look after the needs of communities who live long, alongside it, what does that mean? And if you look at right now, just a simple statistic of animal biomass on our planet, about 62% is livestock. The rest, 35% roughly, is humans. And then only about 4 or 5%, and the numbers keep changing, but about 4 or 5% is wild animals and biodiversity. So we're not really fighting for a lot. There's not that much left out there. And when you realize that it's really this little pocket that we have of biodiversity, we have to protect it right now. And we have to make sure that we're protecting it in a way that is tackling the triple planetary crisis of climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. Thank you. Martin. Um you are the solution to the problems they've described in many ways. How do we get from that 6% to 20% everywhere and 20% to 40%? What will it take by way of innovation? And why should I be excited that we've just gone from Perk to Topcon? <laughs> yeah, so um, the industry is that in fact growing very quickly. So the amount of um, solar being installed sort of roughly has doubled every three years. Um, but last year was from 2022 to 2023 was a really big year, the, the best year for over a decade, but the, the amount installed went up 66%, which is just a massive increase. So, uh, you know, I, I think as uh, the more widespread understanding of how cheap solar has become, um, you know, as that information becomes more widely taken up, we're going to see a sort of natural, strong growth uh, in the industry. Um, many countries have committed to be uh, net carbon zero by, you know, various dates. But I, th I think what would uh, accelerate that transition to a, you know, zero carbon future would be actual programs, documented programs for timetables for um, when those changes required to reach net zero, you know, uh, a timetable and a, and a transition plan for reaching that rather than just specifying of a date. So I think that's what, what really would uh, accept, would accelerate the uh, uptake of solar. Although it's happening very rapidly, the industry has shown it's got the potential to grow very rapidly and uh, has, done, has grown rapidly over the last several decades, but it can supply a lot more than the demand at the moment. And just quickly to wrap us up, why should I be excited that we're going from P-E-R-C to T-O-P-C-O-N? Yeah, they're, they're both technologies that were developed in our lab, but they are battling for market share at the moment. Like Perk had about 90% of the market in 2022, but Topcon is starting to challenge it. But the, um, as I mentioned before, the efficiency, the amount of power that you get out of a given area has enormous leverage in all the costs associated with uh, using solar and the cost of electricity that you generate from them. So the industry is continually pushing to a higher and higher performance. 
So with the silicon cells, they're approaching a limit that I briefly mentioned of 29% efficiency, but there's still this approach of stacking cells of different material that I think will take the industry eventually up to 40% once the, once the uh, research problems involved in doing that have been solved. So efficiency is important, so that's why the, there's a continual battle between uh, the, these technologies to make sure that the industry is extracting the full potential possible from the uh, technology that's available. And Topcon's the new... Topcon's the new king of the, ki king of the market at the moment. So it's um, had about 10% market share last year, but it'll probably be 20 or 30% this year, and then following year, it'll dominate the market. I think that means we're over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Terrific panel. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <laughs>